Don't let the Thunder success overshadow just how good Cason Wallace can be for this team. His ceiling is extremely high. We'll talk about that on today's show. You are Locked On Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Locked On Thunder podcast, on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, media member, and beat writer for InsideTheThunder.com, Ryland Styles. Follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LOThunderPod. Email the show, LOThunderPod at gmail.com. On today's show, brought to you by FanDuel. We're going to talk about the Oklahoma City Thunder dismantling the Memphis Grizzlies, Case and Wallace's potential, Josh Giddy's fit with this team as he has another big game to cap off a really big week from him and much more. Today's show, again, is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with a winning of any $5, uh, $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. Go visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. And today's show is, of course, honored and dedicated to Brennan Urbar, who hit a half-court shot at the Thunder Media game. He's a lights-out shooter, the best shooter you've ever seen, not in the NBA. Uh, so shout-out to him uh, at, at Daily Thunder over there. Uh, of course, you all know who Brennan is, friend of the show. And this show, dedicated to him. What a great run it was for the media uh, basketball game to get together and uh, get some buckets Led the led the night in screen assists. Not a big deal. Not a big deal. Tr- truly dedicated to the brand of Locked On uh, for that to be one of my calling cards in pickup hoops. But uh, in this show, we're going to talk about Casey Wallace. And Casey Wallace has a much higher ceiling than any of us do who played uh, pickup basketball tonight. But with Casey Wallace, I think that it's easy to let the Thunder's overall record overshadow how good Casey Wallace can be because they're already 45 and 19 and they're incredible at home, you know, 26 and six, 19 and 13 on the road that they have, you know, the best offense, defense, net rating, like, like the top five and all those categories. Um, you know, they are an awesome team. They've done so much to put themselves into this contender status, the best winning percentage in the Western conference. They've done it all. Like they've done every, they've checked all the boxes of like, this team is a really, really, really good team. And on this team, Casey Wallace is only asked to be this, you know, super utility player who slots into the starting five. Whenever anyone gets hurt, he's literally played for, for Shea. He's played for one through five almost. Uh, Of course, Chet's not missed a game yet, but he's played guard. He's played forward. He's done, you know, the dirty work at the four. Uh, whenever Jada's missed time, which we'll talk about coming up about Jada, but you know, whenever you look at him, it's easy to fall into. This is just what Thunder basketball is going to be for the next however long. But in reality, this Thunder team is going to continue to evolve. This is just the starting point for how good they are. This initial punch of what they look like. Because I think that Casey Wallace can play a much bigger and will play a much bigger role in the future. And you continue to see him get better and better as this season goes on. He had a career night against Memphis, and I get it. This whole podcast is going to be caveated with the fact that Memphis is awful. They are, they are just dismembered with injuries, and it's a season that will be forgotten in Memphis or remembered for all the wrong reasons. So beating down Memphis, you know, no matter who plays well or no matter who does what, it does not have the same sting. It does not mean as much as almost any other team in the NPA. But you still saw the flashes of how good Case and Wallace can be. And you've seen them consistently all season long, independent of who he's been playing. Just as an overall player, like this season, according to Synergy, he's in the 90th percentile in overall possessions on offense, 88th percentile in transition, 
84th percentile in half court. He's over a point per possession in all of those categories, including 1.3 points per possession in transition. He's done this you know, awesome play finishing role for the Thunder, 1.3 points per possession on cuts. In his very limited uh, opportunities as a pick and roll role man, as a guard to guard screener, he's been excellent. Like he's just capitalized in every which way. Catch and shoot, he's shooting 44% on catch and shoot chances. At the rim, he's shooting 70% at the rim as a guard, as a rookie. Like he has been awesome in this season. And it's easy to forget that like this is the 10th overall pick in the draft and a good draft and a very good draft. And this complimentary play finishing role is not the role he's destined to be in for a significant amount of time. Like this off season will be huge for him because he's almost been a victim of his own success in a way. You know, you, you look at what, you know, Marcus said, pre-game about Usman Jang, about, about how they're using the blue, not only to get Usman Jang ready for what he'll be asked to do with the Thunder routinely, but they're using the blue as a chance to get Usman Jang reps that he just could not get with the Thunder. No matter how well Usman Jang was playing with the Thunder, even if he was one of their best rotational players all year long, as Kaysen has been, there's just not enough ball handling reps for Usman Jang, and that's an area of his game as this 6'11 wing that you do not want to just just abandon. You do not want to just stop trying to, to flower that, that to water that flower, so to say, of, of Usa's playmaking ability. So they've worked that in more uh, with the blue, with Usman Jang. Whereas with Casey Wallace, he's been so good. He's been so impactful. He's been so important. He's not getting any of those, of those recreational reps, if you will. I'll just go have some fun and try to maximize his skill. Obviously, it's very calculated whenever Oost and other players are developing a skill. But nonetheless, he's not getting to deviate from what the Thunder need him to be good at right now in the here and now. That's where this summer will come in, and he'll continue to work as a playmaker, something he did a lot in college, looked very good at in college and in high school. His versatility is just striking as a perfect fit for what the Thunder want as a guy who can play on and off ball. And I think you're going to see him play more on ball next year, and and, and he'll get that from the summer. But in the here and now, he's been one of the best bench players for the Thunder. In the future, I think that his potential is is unlimited. Because I will be shocked if Cason Wallace is not an elite defender. Like, when it's all said and done, if he's not an elite defender, someone who is recognized around the NBA as a top-notch guy on that side of the floor, I'll be stunned. And then offensively, at worst, he'll be the super efficient play finisher. And at best, he'll continue to add on to that as he already has throughout this season. And for his time in Oklahoma City, of course, it's going to be difficult to truly cash in on, on most of the accolades, right? Because SGA will never stop being an all-star to the day he retires from this point forward you know, barring, barring any, you know, injury, whatever. So SGA is automatically an all-star teams have to be incredibly good to get multiple all-stars, but this Thunder team is going to be that good and is going to be good enough to warrant multiple all-stars. But then you got to go down the list of you know, J-Dub's not slowing down. Chet's not slowing down. So now you're in that category of, yeah, Kaysen's incredibly good, but can you justify four or five all-stars for this, the same team? And history just tells us that you're not, but Kaysen is so good that like he will be in that Derek White conversation of a guy that is widely, widely accepted as, hey, that's that's a player who is an all-star level player. It's just that he he's not going to make the team. He's not gonna he's not gonna get there a ton because he's he's playing on this good team, like like how Derek White's playing in Boston, of course. Uh, you know, he's not gonna be a perennial all-star because it's gonna be too tough to uh to outdo his teammates. But like this season, there was no, no questioning if Derek White was an all-star level player. I think that this is going to be the same way for Casey Wallace. I think that Casey Wallace will be that exact same way. And you'll only see his role grow. And with that growing role, 
I don't expect any efficiency drop off. I look at him the same way that you, you look at what Jada did last year. You know, last year, everybody was worried about his efficiency and, and, and it possibly taking a dip. I was very confident it would not take a dip. It's gotten better for Jada. Like they are just very inherently um, high high processing basketball players who are going to make the right decision, make the right read, put themselves and others in the right position, and that leads to being efficient. Also, of course, it, it helps to play with other high level high level players where you're not being uh, tasked with you know hounding defense that forces you to take a bad shot because you're the only guy on the floor. So like all those things mixed together and coupled together. But with Casey Wallace on his career night against Memphis, you really saw that he can be um, just this high level player for OKC, and I think that he can be an all star. It's just in what context can he be an all star? Like can he be an actual like go to the mid mid winter classic all star? Or will, it, will he be destined to be an all-star where everyone understands he's a very good player, but there's just not enough spots at the all-star game in this very talented league. And of course, with the, uh, with the inherent, like same team kind of uh, concept, that we just talked about. So case and Wallace though, really good versus Memphis. We'll talk more about that game coming up, but first I want to tell you right now, pretty good friends over at better help, check out better help right now. They can help you. And I think that better helps great. Because if you believe that you could benefit from therapy and you think that that can really help you, it's easy to process that like, hey, I could really use this tool, this resource. And then dismiss it in your own mind of, well, I'm too busy. Like that's what's always gotten me, for example, of, oh, I'm just too busy. I got to do this, got to do that. You've got family obligations, work obligations, social obligations. You've got all these things pulling you each direction. It's very hard to to come to terms with going to an actual brick and mortar building and setting up an appointment and being there and, and, and going face to face to therapy. However, that's where better, better help comes in. Because if you think that you can benefit from therapy, you should go get that benefit at better help because it's there to fit around your schedule. It's entirely online. It's entirely there for you to get something off your chest that you need to, because it's important, big or small, that certain things really start to fester with you that you get them off your chest. Uh, and of course it's easy and it is especially helpful to do that with someone who's unbiased in your life. So go there right now to better help and go there to betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA to get 10% off on your first deposit uh, because it's all online, all around your schedule. So you're able to make it work for you. Uh, check it out today. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash locked on NBA. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked on in BA. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you, talking Thunder basketball. Case and Wallace was awesome. 22 points career high for him, two boards, four assists, and a block against Memphis. He shot 64% from the floor, 66% from three, hitting four threes, including just this nasty step back where it was a little bit of a heat check, but it was it was pure off the bench, and he was a big part of that Thunder bench unit, which chipped in a lot of points. Of course, it's Memphis. And like when you look at this game uh, against the Grizzlies, it's hard to take much away from it. It's a 38-point wire-to-wire victory that saw no lead changes, that saw no ties, and the Thunder start out on a 13 to 3 run before the first Memphis timeout, and it just felt over at that point. And you know, not to discredit Memphis, not to discredit their coach. I think that Jenkins is a great coach. This game felt over after 13 to 3. They're just too injury ridden. And this Memphis team didn't have that fight to even make it a game at all. <laughs> at all. And so Oklahoma City did their job though. They didn't play with their food. They went and they took care of business and they got the win. The Thunder won the rebounding battle 46-39. They uh, you know, forced six more turnovers, 16 to 10. The Thunder won points in the paint by six. They won second chance points, 19 to eight. And second chance points was uh, was going to Memphis 14 to 14 to nine fast break points with OKC. The Thunder shot 52, 44, and 100 in their shooting splits. Memphis shot 41, 33. And 66. Case and Wallace defensively, just a menace. I mean, him and Lou Dort combined to just harass Luke Kennard and force him to throw an errant pass. I mean, that that would be illegal in 49 of the 50 states, what those two guys did. Lou Dort 
got two steals. He also beat Jaron Jackson Jr. just to a spot and looked like a safety out there, just beating him to a spot, getting the steal, and heading the other way. Lou Dort went five for five in this game, four for four from three, two boards and 14 points. He continues his hot streak. He's been one of the best three-point shooters in the NPA, which is which is just crazy to say, but just shows his progression and shows his overall improvement. And I think that with Lou Dort, there should be no concern that it's going to revert revert back. Number one, there's anything about Lou Dort that you should know after you know five years. It's that he's going to play his best basketball when the lights are the brightest. So I don't expect this shooting to fall off as these games grow in importance. And then number two, I think that it came down to he has made the necessary adjustments. That's all there is to it. He has processed his old shot diet and his old, uh, you know, bad shot selection, and he's ridded himself of bad shots. And I think that these games against Memphis are important because I know it's a toothless team and a team that just had no threat. But when you start four for four, and when you're shooting as good and confidently as Ludort is, and Ludort's been money, you know, going back to that Sacramento game on the back to back against Dallas, when you're shooting this well, it's easy to allow yourself, especially in a game like Memphis, where you know, I know, your grandmother knows, everyone knows that the game was over before it started. It's easy to let yourself have a cheat day, so to say, and say, well, they, they have no ch- shot of coming back. I'm shooting the ball well. Let's just throw up some heat checks. Let's take some wild drives to the rim. He didn't do that. He played his efficient 22 minutes. He took care of business. He played his role. It was a plus 26 and got off the floor. That's why it continues to feel more real. Because this is just what Ludor does now. This is just who Ludor is now. And it's great for the Thunder. It is great for the Thunder. Speaking of great for the Thunder, Josh Giddy this week has been really, really good. This was another great game. Only played 19 minutes. Thunder didn't need him to play any more than that because they were winning. He was a plus 22. He had 10 rebounds, 16 points, four assists, but they were allowed four assists. Like the ways he was just whipping the ball around, it was really impressive. Got two steals as well. First and foremost, this was a game that felt better for Josh because he finally took the step to play as though he understood his size advantage. And now, look, you're not going to have that size advantage versus every team. And Josh, as we've talked about in this show, is going to play better versus teams who do not have a rim-protecting threat. But you've still got to go out there and execute. You've still got to go out there and do it. And from you know turning the corner and getting downhill and attacking the rim hard to putting a body on guys on the glass and, and, and going for rebounds and not giving up on them, not being flat-footed, being athletic, and getting up in the air and getting boards. Those were all things that were really, really good from him. As he gets 10 rebounds, seven of them came on the defensive end. And then the four assists. He was awesome with his back to the basket, passing out of that that, uh, high post slot area, back to the basket. He got out and and got some... uh, Got to stretch his legs a bit in transition, which which was going to help him, of course, as a player who's built to have the ball in his hands, built to push the pace. But the way he can operate, kind of let, letting a play develop with his back to the basket, he flung that pass over a few defenders to Case and Cutting. He's talented enough to put the ball where it needs to be. And he's talented enough to play with anticipation and lead you to a spot and play the way you would describe a quarterback. But to do that, you have to score inside the arc. To do that, you have to to get downhill and score at the rim. He shot one for four from three. I I think that that he had all good shots, though. 
He got blocked at the rim the, the, the first attempt of the game. He did not let that deter him. He did not let that that change his his mindset in this game. That was really good. You know, his his four threes, they came within the offense. They didn't look like sputter out threes, which you saw, you know, earlier this year, how teams were guarding him. And at times you just kind of hold the ball and 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 hope for the best and then just jack up a three and, and, and just had no prayer of going in. He felt good with the shot. Sometimes they rim out. But the process was there. And he only had one turnover. And you look at Josh Kitty, he plays his best basketball when you act like that basketball's hot potato. And you get that hot potato out of your hands as fast as possible. When he's making quick decisions because of his high-level processing skills and seeing the floor very well, and his ability to, to make the pass. Like you might be able to see a pass and, and see a guy, hey, he's open, but you have no way of getting him the ball. Josh Giddy has a way of getting you that ball. You know, if he sees you, you can get it to you. But you got to make quick decisions. And with this Thunder team, there are so many plays where the end guy gets the credit, where you know an SGA, you know, step back gets the credit, or a Jada Dunk gets the credit. But it was set up all throughout the possession by constant ball movement, by constant player movement, and all that leads to getting defenses on their heels. And you have three guys, Shea, J-Dub, Chet, who if defenses are on their heels against them, they can take advantage. How many times do you look on the floor and say, that center's no matchup for Chet? Or say, that guy can't guard j or that guy can't guard SGA? When those guys who are already at an inherent disadvantage and cannot match up with their guys one on one are now chasing their tail through a couple screens, through a couple ball swings, through a couple rotations, and you force them to make correct rotations, then you give yourself an even wider advantage. Because the thing is, even if you rotate very well, you've had to sh- sh- switch your momentum, you've had to switch. Um, just your stance and your body positioning and you've played into the hands and you've kind of tipped your hand of where you're leaning and these guys can just explode through it and cash in. It's sort of like in baseball where, you know, it used to be, I know it's not this way anymore, but you just want to put the ball in play, especially at lower levels, not at the major league level, but at lower levels, you want to put the ball in play a lot because odds are high school and below, especially, put the ball in play, they're going to make an error. So even if you hit a ground ball to short, it's a high percentage chance that you're going to be safe or that something can go awry. You keep the defenses moving, there's a high percentage chance that there's going to be a breakdown. There's going to be a communication flaw. Or there's going to be an opportunity for you to get Shea on the center or to get shot on a guard or to get one of these other outcomes that are very, very, very advantageous for the Thunder. So whenever Josh Giddy is playing like the ball's a hot potato and keeping the offense in a flow, it opens things up for everyone else. And it leads to hockey assists and leads to things that doesn't show up in the stat sheet, but shows up in the eye test. And eye test tells you this entire week, don't care what the box score plus minus was, don't care what the rebounds were, don't care what this was or that was. The eye test tells you that Josh Giddy was a much better fit for the Thunder this week. And of course, the, the, the stats do dictate that as well. I'm just saying. The eye test tells you that, especially it was a much better fit for the Thunder this week than it has been this season for Josh Giddy, and he's getting com- more comfortable in what's being asked of him. And I'll continue to say, everything's back on the table this summer, but for the next couple of months, take away the sixth overall pick, take away the ceiling of Josh Giddy, take away what you thought he'd be, what you'd hoped he'd be, what he should be, take it all away. And just look at this team from this point to whenever the season ends through the prism of can Josh Giddy on this night just be the fifth best starter and the fifth best defender? If those two answers are yes, you're going to win a lot more games than you're going to lose. You're going to be unstoppable a lot more times than not. So it's why the Thunder are first in the West right now. They've, they've had a great season, even with some growing pains from Josh. But it's also why you stick with Josh Giddy's 
growing pains and not just cave in a way of like, it was not working. Everyone can say it was not working. Josh Giddy says it's not working. Everyone says it's not working. But the reason why you don't just say, okay, at the first sign of adversity in a 21 year old's career, let's stop having you try this and let's go right back to Josh, you're going to play off the bench and just play as a lead playmaker. And now you've never learned this skill. You've never learned to play with others because the Thunder were able to balance both. They were able to balance still winning a lot of games and also balance, hey, Josh, we're not just going to revert back to what you're good at. You're going to have to catch up to this role and catch up to what we're asking you to do right now to better fit the entire complement of players on this team. And he's done that this week. That's only a week-long sample size, but it just shows you why they still kept hitting their hitting the, the pickaxe against the cobblestone or wherever they hit to try to find diamonds to eventually have a breakthrough. And this week's been a, break, a breakthrough. Now, it's not been a big enough breakthrough through to just say that this is all uh, set in stone and it's all good. You found whatever the, the lesser tier of diamond is, you're still looking for that diamond of like, hey, this is for sure going to work consistently. But it's a really good start. Can you stack good days and, and good weeks upon that one week? Can you stack a good week this week where you're playing Indiana, Dallas, and Memphis again? You're almost guaranteed one good game. Can you get a? Can you steal a game, uh, or, or not steal a game? But can you can you play better against Indiana and Dallas, especially Dallas, than what we've seen uh, in the past? Dallas is a team that's going to be a you know, pot potential matchup for you. So it's going to be interesting to see what Josh Gay looks like. But he was good against Memphis. He was good this week, uh, and I think that if you flip that mindset of like what you're supposed to be viewing Josh Giddy as things look a lot better. Things look a lot better for OKC coming up. Let's talk J Dub and his ankle injury and his social media posts and everything else uh, and get you set for tonight's game. But first I want to tell you right now, but good friends over at locked on uh, FanDuel slash locked on that's FanDuel.com slash locked on because right now new customers get a hundred and $50 in bonus bets. That's $150 in bonus bets. If your first $5 bet hits, it's that easy. Place a $5 bet, have it hit, and you get $150 in bonus bets. That's great. That's awesome. And this is a great time to go over to fandle.com slash locked on. Because if you're just an NBA fan, I hear you. If that's the only sport that you think that you'd enjoy betting on and you feel more comfortable betting on, they got the NBA for you from awards to spreads, to over-unders, all that good stuff. For example, the Thunder at home, as a really good home team, are seven-point favorites against Indiana today. You can go bet on that. But you want to venture out into college basketball as March Madness heats up, conference tournaments, and uh, the big dance next week, you can go do that. Baseball's just around the corner. Not long will it be until opening day, March 28th. So you can go bet on uh, awards and future odds for the World Series and all that good stuff over there. Do anything you want to at fandle.com slash locked on. That's fandle.com slash locked on. Fandle.com slash locked on. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you, talking Thunder basketball. Jalen Williams. Jalen Williams hobbled to the locker room twice. The second time, he was not able to return. He took two different falls. One was at half court. One was uh, stepping around or on uh, a camera person on the baseline after a bucket. Uh, and he then took to Twitter and posted a face palm emoji on Twitter and then took to Instagram and posted a picture of him um, with a towel over his face in black and white, which is the aesthetic he typically goes for on Instagram, just as an aside. And then on top of that, he went and blanked his Instagram. I don't know what it's technically called. The, the youths do this a lot because it's not technically deleting because I believe that on Instagram, there's a way to just get everything back the way it was if you want to. So I don't think he's deleted it. I think that he can just, you can just blank it out or hide it and then make it return onto your feed whenever you feel like you want to. Uh, but anyway, he, he cleared out his feeds on both his accounts. Um, and people were just going buku berserk over it. What does this mean? What does this mean? Is the season over? How bad's the injury? And then the initial injury report comes out, which mind you that these they update these these hourly. And mind you that 
we won't have a firm update until we talk to Mark at about 5.15 today. But the initial injury report comes out, and J-Dub is questionable with that ankle sprain. Not immediately ruled out, which is a really good sign. Also, of course, not entirely off the injury report, the way that Shea was last week, whenever uh, we all thought that Shea you know, took a really nasty hit to the thigh and was hobbling around in that Portland game. He ended up not being on the injury report at all and playing through, through that. Jacob's at least questionable. A shoot around, we'll see if he's out there. We'll see if he's uh, working around. Now, I will say this too. If he's not out there, that's also not a sign, period. Because the portion that we see is after the official shoot around, if you will, just for making it simple. And, you know, that's kind of like an optional, like continuing the shoot around if you want to. Usually, j is there. So if he's not there, it is something that's worth noting. But it's not a finality at, at all. The finality will be whatever Mark says at, at 5.15. Uh, so keep your ears and eyes peeled for that. Uh, but listen, I think that at the, end, at the end of the day, it was clearly not a devastating injury because he wouldn't be questionable. If it was something just super severe, he would have been ruled out already for this game against Indiana. And I think that you know, J-Dub is a, is a guy that, that enjoys social media, this whole team is chronically online. Chet Holmgren was, was very blatant about that at shoot around uh, the other day, <laughs> whenever uh, he was asked like, Hey, you know, we don't want to say that you're chronically online, but and he says, no, 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 we're chronically online. So like these guys get it. These guys understand the reaction that they're inciting whenever they do things like this. I think it's a little fun. I think that, I think that if you had the power to tweet one emoji and have all these people freak out, you would do it. We'd all do it. So I think it's also, to not fully discredit j Dub. I think it's also very frustrating if you're an athlete and you're a competitor and you're playing a very big week of, this is a really good in, in, in the Indiana team. They're fun to watch. I bet they're fun to play against and just trying to match up with them. And then you're playing Dallas, who left a very sour taste in your mouth uh, just a few weeks ago and is a potential you know playoff team who you're going to want to get more data points on in the future you know, for the future. So if you were even having to miss just two games, you know, th- th- that has to be very frustrating for a team that is hitting their stride, got a big win that you didn't get to be much a part of uh, and kept off a really good week. So I- I- I'm very sure it is frustrating for a competitor to, even if he only had to miss one or two games to miss those said games. Uh, but I also don't think that it was as traumatic as, uh, as what many people read into it. And it clearly seems like it wasn't because he's listed as questionable at this moment. Uh, he's dealt with this before. Uh, so far, he's missed six games. They all came in three-game bunches. Uh, so we'll see if anything happens, if he if he plays against Indiana or if he if he has to sit out. Again, about 5.15 will be the calling card for that. Typically, they wait and let Mark announce that they could upgrade him, of course, earlier than that because the injury report does update hourly. Uh, but that's just kind of what the status quo would be. I would say 4.15 all the way up to 5.15. Uh, you, will, you will wait in between that time frame to get the official word on Jada if I had to guess. But that's what happened against the Memphis Grizzlies. That's what happened on social media. The latest brouhaha, the latest tea, if the if the youth still call it that. I don't know if they still call it tea. Maybe he moved on to coffee. But again, this was a fun show. This was very fun to uh, uh, you know have it back on the new look format. Let me know what you think about uh, these starting today and moving forward, dropping uh, a closest to midnight as possible, of course, for example, Thursday against Dallas. It's not going to be able to drop at midnight. The game will probably still be going on at midnight, or at least we'll still be uh, waiting on players to come into the press conference room. So uh, clearly that'll be a bit delayed, but in general, uh, very close to midnight as possible. Nonetheless, though, thank you all for joining us. Subscribe for free across all podcasting platforms because we're ramping up this show with its new uh, kind of feel, new consistent timing, and some really, really, really good guests coming up. You will not want to miss it as the Thunder push forward to their first playoff run of this Locked on Thunder era. And and they tried to get their first playoff series win since Kevin Durant was in town. Can they do it? We'll cover it all on Locked on Thunder. Subscribe anywhere you get your podcast from, including on YouTube. And until tomorrow, be good and be good to one another.